everybody is going to get a prompt. So if you just click yes there, then uh, Dr. Bishra, uh, Dr. Bishir Lahi, over to you to kick off the evening. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Uh, Gary, are you ready? And Gary, I'm uh, triggered. Uh, yes, here. I had a little problem unmuting, but I'm ready. Go ahead, please. O thou kind Lord, O thou who art generous and merciful, we are the servants of thy threshold and are gathered beneath the sheltering shadow of thy divine unity. The sun of thy mercy is shining upon all, and the clouds of thy bounty shower upon all. Thy gifts encompass all. Thy loving providence sustains all. Thy protection overshadows all, and the glances of thy favor are cast upon all. O Lord, grant thine infinite bestowals, and let the light of thy guidance shine. Illumine the eyes, gladden the hearts with abiding joy, confer a new spirit upon all people, and bestow upon them eternal life. Unlock the gates of true understanding and let the light of faith shine resplendent. Gather all people beneath the shadow of thy bounty and cause them to unite in harmony so that they may become as the rays of one sun, as the waves of one ocean, and as the fruit of one tree. May they drink from the same fountain. May they be refreshed by the same breeze. May they receive illumination from the same source of light. Thou art the giver, the merciful, the omnipotent. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Corey, are you ready? Yes. Friends, I'll be reading from Gleanings. And as I read this, uh, bear in mind that within two generations of when this was written, the world would be consumed by the fires of the world wars. 
Members of the human race, hold ye fast by the cord which no man can sever. This will indeed profit you all the days of your life, for its strength is of God, the Lord of all worlds. Cleave ye to justice and fairness, and turn away from the whisperings of the foolish, them that are estranged from God, that have decked their heads with the ornament of the learned, and have condemned to death him who is the fountain of wisdom. My name hath uplifted them to lofty grades, and yet no sooner did I reveal myself to their eyes than they, with manifest injustice, pronounced the sentence of my death. Thus hath our pen revealed the truth, and yet the people are sunk in heedlessness. Whoso cleaveth to justice can under no circumstances transgress the limits of moderation. He discerneth the truth in all things through the guidance of him who is the all-seeing. The civilization so often vaunted by the learned exponents of arts and sciences will, if allowed to overleap the bounds of moderation, bring great evil upon men. Thus warneth you he who is the all-knowing. If carried to excess, civilization will prove as prolific a source of evil as it had been of goodness when kept within the restraints of moderation. Meditate on this, O people, and be not of them that wander distraught in the wilderness of error. The day is approaching when its flame will devour the cities, when the tongue of grandeur will proclaim, the kingdom is God's, the almighty, the all praised. Thank you, thank you, uh, Corey. Thank you very much. Uh, Jane, are you ready? Uh, yes. It's, it's my pleasure to... It, sorry about the echo. There's an echo? Rob? Yeah, it's okay now. Okay. It's, it's my pleasure to introduce actor-writer Rain Wilson. Rain is one of the most popular actors in the world and is best known, of course, for playing the role of Dwight on the Emmy-winning The Office. At the same time, he's raised the bar on what it means to be a Baha'i. He's worked hard at his profession and inspired by his belief, has used his success to uplift the world in many ways. Let me share a few. He co-founded the Lita Foundation, an educational initiative in Haiti that empowers at-risk women and girls through the arts. In addition, he's active in addressing climate change, producing the recent documentary, The Idiot's Guide to Climate Change. Another initiative, he co-founded the very successful Soul Pancake, a digital media company that seeks to tackle life's big questions, exploring what it means to be human, comfort food for the soul. Their tagline is, we make stuff that matters. The idea behind the platform is to get us thinking about life's deeper meaning on love, faith, and death. They do it in inspiring, fun, and often silly ways. My personal favorite is when they invite two random strangers to become friends by jumping in a pit of plastic balls and then starting meaningful conversations based on the questions printed on the balls. Rain then wrote the New York Times bestseller, Soul Pancake. That includes sample questions for us to start our own conversations on life's big questions. And further, for people interested in learning more about the Baha'i faith and the contributions individual Baha'is are making, Rain hosts the inspiring Baha'i broadcasts on which he interviews notable people about the intersection of their faith and their work. And last, the very best way Rain uplifts us is by being here this evening for a heart-to-heart -heart discussion about questions that matter most. Rain? Hmm. Oh. oh, whoops, that's on me. There you go. Wonderful. Wow, what an introduction. Holy moly. Um, Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I told uh, Nasir, Dr. Nasir earlier on, he was kind of gushing and I told him he could be the president of my fan club. <laughs> um, nice to see you all, uh, all 74 of you. Many of you are in Maryland, um, but I see Linda Kavlin pop off from Hawaii. <laughs> Aloha, what are you doing? Well, she's muted, but it's okay, Linda. No one wants to hear your voice anyway, but nice to see you. You look radiant and I love you. 
So um, thanks for having me, folks. Uh, this is awfully nice. Um, what a wonderful gathering you guys are uh, are getting together. And, um, uh, you know, I just thought tonight that, um, oh, would it be possible? First of all, congratulations on Maryland still being a state. I mean, <laughs> you know, Maryland and, and Delaware, they really don't, when you think about it, do we really need them? You know, do we really need them as states? Um, you could combine them easily. Um, Maryland could just join with Virginia and Del Delaware could be part of New Jersey or something like that. So congratulations on making it all this time. I mean, that's, that's really remarkable. 200 years, Maryland is still a state somehow or other, somehow you've done it. So I, um, so that's nice. Is it possible, uh, Alex, to allow me to message chat the whole everyone that's here or not? Or is that yep. not possible? Definitely. I'll change the setting right here. Cool. There you go. Um, I, I was just going to talk for a little bit. I, I really don't have a prepared talk. Sometimes I do talks and I have, you know, I, I put a lot of work into preparation. I have a theme and I have a PowerPoint and, and I'm really sorry you're not getting one of those, but there's some of those online and if you wanted to right now you could just drop off this live talk and you could just go on youtube and find one of my better talks this is going to be in fact this is going to be one of the worst talks that i've ever given so apologies in advance on that but it's just maryland you know if it if this was like virginia i'd be like oh thomas jefferson virginia wow university of virginia scholarly, you know, classy. But Maryland is like crabs, boats. I don't even know what, I can't even tell you. The Ravens, I can't even tell you what else. Poe, I guess that's, that's what you got going for you. Anyway, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, my spiritual journey and, and spirituality and kind of why I'm here and why we are all here, I imagine. And then um, we can um, get into, really get into some questions because I'd much rather kind of be in a dialogue with you, with you guys. I, I was very much struck by the, um, the prayer that we started off tonight. So I'm gonna put it in the chat and it won't let me cut and paste it into the chat, that's weird. Wow. Hmm. That's strange. Why would that not happen? I can type into the chat, but I can't paste into the chat. This is very weird. And I can paste there. It must be some fancy setting. Okay, well, someone will get this. Um... Alex can do it. We'll grab it. You have it there, Alex? Uh, it'll take a sec. Sorry for Two the minutes. um sorry for the uh inconvenience here, folks. I was struck by the prayer. I thought it was very beautiful. Um I'm gonna say a lot of ra seemingly random things and then hopefully they'll all add up to something. Number one is welcome to day seven um of um uh, uh no, I don't want to start with that. I want to say that this was a beautiful prayer. Now, I teach a, a Baha'i uh, children's class, uh, among other things. Um, and a lot, we talk about prayer a lot. And there's a beautiful analogy because um, it's easy to, um, gosh, I'm really, this is the worst talk I've ever given. I need to like pull my thoughts together here. This is just the worst. You guys are not, how much did you pay for this? <laughs> Um, we, in, it's a very interesting phenomenon, I thought, because in the United States, there's about half of the country prays 
and about the other half of the country meditates. Because in California, like everyone meditates all the time, but no one prays. And then in mid-America, everyone prays and no one meditates. So Baha'is pray and meditate. And, and that's something that's a, a, a part of my daily spiritual practice is to do both of those things. And this is a beautiful prayer by Abdul Baha. And Abdul Baha uh, was the son of the founder of the Baha'i faith, whose name was Baha'u'llah. And he holds a very special station to the Baha'is. Uh, and I'm speaking to those who are not Baha'is. The, 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 I think, I don't know, maybe a third or half of you are not Baha'is. So I'm really speaking mostly to you. I'm not sure how much you know about the Baha'i faith, but it was founded by Baha'u'llah in the 19th century in Persia. And um, Baha'u'llah proclaimed himself to be um, a holy teacher, a divine teacher. Baha'is call, uh, in, a, in a long line of holy teachers and divine teachers that include many names that you've heard of from the distant past, such as Lord Krishna, or Abraham, or Moses, or the Buddha, and Jesus, and Muhammad, and many others, many countless others that we don't know about because they weren't included, they didn't have a written history in indigenous uh, spiritual teachers. So Baha'is believe that there is this kind of uh, a, a special class of divine teacher that holds a very special station, and Baha'u'llah is one of those. And in the Baha'i writings, they're, uh, they're called uh, divine physicians. And I have a couple quotes on that. Abdul Baha says that Baha'u'llah is the divine, Abdul Baha, again, his eldest son, who Baha'is hold in this very special station as the kind of perfect example of Baha'u'llah's writings, of Baha'u'llah's message. And Abdul Baha says, Baha'u'llah is the divine physician who diagnoses the world's malady. For the whole planet is ill and needs the power of a great specialist. Baha'u'llah's teachings are the health of the world. That's quite a sentence. Baha'u'llah's teachings are the health of the world. They represent the spirit of this age, the light of this age, the well being of this age, the soul of this cycle. The world will be at rest when they are put into practice, for they are reality. Um, oh, Alex put the prayer there. Thank you so much. Maybe it was too long. Maybe that was the deal. Was that the deal, Alex? Yep. Uh, basically, you had to cut it in half. So I love this image of a divine physician. The world is ill. So mm -hmm. I guess why, you know, why are we having this conversation? Why are we getting together on the Zoom? Why are a bunch of Baha'is um, we're an eclectic bunch, Baha'is, there's a bunch of Persians, there's a bunch of Bohemians, there's a bunch of former hippies, there's a bunch of, you know, religious scholars, and, um, you know, it's a very diverse uh, group of people. Why are we here talking about spiritual concepts in the Baha'i faith? And I guess that's really why, what I wanted to talk about, because as I was thinking about this talk tonight, I was like, well, why am I... Why am I giving this talk? Why do people, why should people care? Why should you care at all about what some weird actor with a chess hat says about religion? And of all things, religion. I mean, give me a break. I'm gonna get to the prayer in a minute. Um, here's another, well-known quote from Abdul Baha. If you can look in your chat, I don't know if this is a good way to do it. I don't have a PowerPoint prepared around this. If you're capable of looking in your chat, 
those of you who are younger than say 62 know how to look in a chat of a Zoom and a Zoom meeting. <laughs> um, now I'm, I'm mocking everyone. Everyone from Maryland's mad. Everyone over 62 is mad. Hippie, Baha former hippie Baha'is are mad. Um, I have a tendency to do that. But uh, Abdul Baha says, so we talked about Baha'u'llah being a divine physician, that the world is ill, that the world can be at rest with his message. Hmm. And Abdul Baha says, if religion becomes a cause of dislike, hatred, and division, it were better to be without it. And to withdraw from such a religion would be a truly religious act. Any religion which is not a cause of love and unity is no religion. This is a profound, <laughs> this is an absolutely profound message coming from the leader of a religion because after Baha'u'llah passed away, Abdul Baha, his son became, his eldest son became the center of the covenant, the, the leader of the Baha'i faith for many decades thereafter. And here is the leader of a religion saying to withdraw from a religion because of dislike, hatred, and division that it sows is a religious act. I, I recently came across this quote. I, I couldn't believe my eyes. I mean, it's, it's truly revolutionary. Um, you don't hear that from a lot of religious faiths. So I guess one of the reasons that we're having this conversation tonight is that us Baha'is believe that Baha'u'llah is a divine physician that has a message for um for humanity that can cause the health of the world so that's that's cool um he says his baha'u'llah's teachings are the health of the world the health of the world so because this is i find it a struggle sometimes to talk about my faith or talk about the ideas contained in my faith because people are so opposed to the idea of religion and well they should be because it is a truly religious act to jettison any belief or any interaction with a religious faith that sows dislike hatred and division so anyone who has stayed away from religion and say i don't like organized religion because it has sown dislike hatred and division amen brother amen sister that is a truly religious act. And that is what we see throughout the world today. But is there the possibility, could you withhold a little bit of a shadow of a doubt that there is the possibility that whatever the ills of the world are, that the health of the world might come from a religion? I know it's crazy because all we see is religion causing disunity. It's a, it's, a, it's a crazy thought, but just take that 3% of your brain pan that might allow for that remote, let's just stick with that for a little bit. It's interesting, I was having a conversation, I'm writing this um, horror screenplay with this guy and um, he's a good friend of mine, a wonderful human being. And we were talking about religion and we were talking about life and I was talking about some Baha'i stuff and he's kind of unclear and he believes in God, but he's unclear in his views and has some struggles. And we were talking about this very thing and it was really interesting. This is a guy who's college educated. He's had plays produced, you know, off Broadway, he's sold screenplays, he's very successful. Um, uh, he's got a show going to Broadway next year. And, and I, and I said, you know, Matthew Lee, the, the answer to the world's problems might, might lie in religion, you know, religion might be the balm, it might be the health of the world, just like this quote, you know, and and it really blew his mind. And he had never really thought about religion in that way before. He, he'd only thought about religion in terms of like a personal connection with a creator, with um, something that brings 
himself solace and peace uh, and not something that was that could heal the broken systems of the world. And this is one thing that I feel that uh, another thing that the Baha'i faith offers. You know, I grew up a member of the Baha'i faith and some some people who are Baha'is have kind of heard my story maybe too much because I talk about it a lot. Um, but I grew up a member of the Baha'i faith. My parents were Baha'is. There were a lot of people embraced the Baha'i faith in the late 60s and early 70s when people were on a spiritual search. Culturally, people were on a spiritual search all over the world, especially in the Western world during that time, during say 68 to 74, right smack dab in that period, people were on fire looking for spiritual solutions. It was the, they were racial issues and great race, racial disunity and riots because of that. Um, there was the war in Vietnam, the, the, the kind of, white Anglo-Saxon capitalist way of seeing the world that existed in 1963, you know, when in, um, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, Andy Griffith, isn't it? No, not, that's an actor. Like, the, you know, you think about the music, like pre-Beatles music, how, how, much, how, much, how much is that doggy in the window kind of was the number one song in America. And then, all of a sudden, five years later, it's, you know, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane. So, you know, just everything is turned upside down in a very short period of time. And people are looking for answers. And Cat Stevens became a Muslim. And Steve Jobs went and lived uh, on a Buddhist monastery. And the Beatles visited the Maharishi. And everyone was kind of searching for something uh, that there might be some kind of spiritual solution other than what they grew up in. Anyways, so I grew up in that milieu and um, uh, and then I, uh, when I went to become an actor and moved to New York City and I was about 20 years old, I, I left the Baha'i faith um, pretty hard and I just didn't want anything to do with religion. It didn't make any sense to me and God didn't make sense to me and it seemed Fuddy duddy, and I had um, a lot of problems with with all of it, and so just reject rejected it out of hand, whole cloth. And I I realize now that where I went um, was I had I I became very very unhappy. But but deeper than that, I really had mental health issues. Um, I know right now you're looking at me going like this incredibly well-balanced human being, how could he possibly have had any mental health issues? Um, I mock a little bit, but there's nothing funny about them. And as we know, there's a great um, uh, epidemic of mental health issues, especially with younger people today uh, in the world. And I had suffered from a lot of these, uh, depression, uh, clinical depression, severe anxiety disorder, uh, addiction issues, and it was out of the, the, the pain and chaos and disequilibrium of, of, of those times that motivated me to go on a spiritual quest, similar to the spiritual quest that everyone was going on from 1968 to 1974. And that's what, uh, you know, lo very long story, very short, that's what eventually led me back to the Baha'i faith after I, I read the Bible and I read the Quran and I read the Bhagavad Gita and the, the Dhammapadas of the Buddha and the, the Vedas and Upanishads and the holy writings of the world. And because I really wanted to figure this out, I wasn't content to kind of be on the fence about, I, I really was like, there either is a God or there's not a God. There's a lot of people who kind of vaguely kind of believe in a God, but they're not, they're not all in. And I, I know I, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. So this uh, mental health issues and severe unhappiness uh, led me on this journey. And I guess, again, this is what brought me back to, uh, to the Baha'i faith. And I, I read the holy books of the Baha'i faith, um, which I hadn't really done growing up as a Baha'i child and a Baha'i youth. I hadn't really read the gleanings and read the Igon and 
read, you know, the 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 histories um, and the the dawn uh, the dawnbreakers, and um, so it was an opportunity for mm-hmm. me to kind of dive into the works, um, the great seminal works of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha and the central figures of the Baha'i faith. And that's what brought me back around in my later adulthood to the Baha'i faith. And it hasn't always been rosy. Uh, It's been a rocky path and it's been a lot of ups and downs. But I tell you the, in in seeking a a religious mm, solution to my disequilibrium, my internal disequilibrium, I also found a kind of meaning, sense, clarity, and purpose on a larger scale in the writings of Baha'u'llah. So why are we having this discussion? Because we are taught in the Baha'i faith that we're on a twofold, uh, we're on a twofold moral path. Um, and this twofold path is to connect ourselves ever more deeply with the divine within us and without us, to grow our spiritual virtues, to become more and more connected with greater uh, serenity and tranquility, um, the, with a greater sharing of, of love and giving of love. And that's our, that's a one path. And then our other purpose or our other moral purpose is to help make the world a better place and especially to use the teachings and the writings of Baha'u'llah to help make the world a better place. So we have these two and these two things are not like two paths like that diverge in a wood. They're really like a yin and the yang. They're like two, they feed off each other. The more we give to the world and try and make the world a better place in order of service to others, the more that feeds our souls and helps increase our spiritual virtues that we have within us. The more we work on our spiritual virtues, the more we want to give back of those virtues to help make the world a better place. There's this dance between these two aspects um, of being a Baha'i. So again, like, why are, why am I here? Why are any of us here? Why are we talking about all this nonsense? Because we Baha'is believe that you can um, both feed your own personal soul and your own and find great contentment and uh, serenity. And you can also help make the world a better place. And like in that quote I read earlier, uh, Baha'u'llah's it is the health of the world. Baha'u'llah's teachings are the health of the world. So when you read the Baha'i writings, there's a lot about finding inner peace and tranquility and love and serenity inside oneself. And there's a lot about how do we transform the world? How, again, like in my conversation with my friend Matthew Lee, how, how can religion possibly not be a cause of disunity, but a cause of, dare I say it, unity? How can unity become not a cause of division, but a cause of, what is the opposite of division? (laughs) Undivisiveness, again, unity. Um, Instead of hatred, it can foster love. You know, here's another little quote I put in the chat for those of you who are under 62. Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah said, man is in reality a spiritual being. And only when he lives in the spirit is he truly happy. So this goes back to that other moral purpose that we have to work on our spiritual virtues and find greater and greater connection um, to the divine. And I love this quote so much for that. It's so I like simple quotes because they help me because I'm not that smart. Um, Man is in reality a spiritual being. Only when he lives in the spirit is he truly happy. So this helps me when I when I pray and meditate and going back to this prayer that was said earlier, when I pray and meditate, it reminds me that I'm a spiritual being. I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. I've got about 97 years, if I'm lucky, in this weird, schlubby, pasty body. And God bless it and um, having my adventure and and then the body goes 
off to the side and then whatever my spirituality-ness of me is, let's call it a soul, will continue on this journey for eternity. So um, as I am in a daily fashion reminded that I am a spiritual being, I find greater uh, happiness and greater um, serenity. Um, so going back to the prayer, you know, I teach this kids class. We talked about half the country prays and half the country meditates. One of the images we found in this kids class, because it's hard to make 11 year olds, it's hard to get them into the spirit of prayer sometimes, especially if it involves, it's a Zoom classroom. There's this beautiful quote that says that from Abdul Baha that our hearts are connected to the divine realm as if by a telegraph wire. And so I always have them summon that image that when they're saying a prayer, they're sending a telegraph da -da 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 um, connected to the to the divine worlds. There's an incredible power in that. And they seem to get that. And I was thinking about that as we were reading this prayer. Let's look at a little bit in this prayer. Confer a new spirit upon all people and bestow upon them eternal life. And there's so much to talk about that. We could talk about eternal life. We could talk for half an hour about what does that mean, eternal life? I won't get into that right now. We can talk about it later. Gather all people beneath the shadow of thy bounty and cause them to unite in harmony so that they may become as the rays of one sun, the waves of one ocean, and the fruit of one tree. May they drink from the same fountain. May they be refreshed by the same breeze. May they receive illumination from the same source of light. What a beautiful blessing is contained in this prayer. And again, a blessing that if you're holding out that 3% of your brain that could hold for the possibility that religion might provide some answers rather than distractions and divisions, then we all, all of us humans having this, being spiritual beings, having a physical experience can unite in harmony as rays of one sun and waves of one ocean and fruit of one tree, all drinking from the same fountain. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, those are a few things that I wanted to say. I just wanted to talk about why are we gathered here? Why are we talking about all this nonsense? Um, I mean, we're not here to just kind of study, oh, I wonder what the Baha'i faith thinks about Trader Joe's peanut butter pretzels. I mean, that um, that could be interesting, an interesting conversation, but we're here to talk about, you know, essentially the meaning of life um, and why we're on this planet and what is religion's role in that. So that's a little bit about what I wanted to share. And then we, maybe we can just turn this more into a discussion. So if people have questions, I do want to say, Baha'is, God bless them all, bless us everyone. They do love to talk, myself included. So Baha'i, this is not an opportunity for Baha'is to hold forth on their favorite quote or their thought of the day or, or whatever. It's a, my friend Tom calls it the second fireside that you give the fireside and then the Baha'i raises the hand and then they do their, their second fireside. Um, uh, so this isn't that time. So please be sensitive to that. But I'd love to hear from people that aren't Baha'is. We're tasked uh, as Baha'is to engage in meaningful and uplifting conversations. Mm -hmm. And this isn't a conversation to convert you to the Baha'i faith. It's simply conversations that talk about living in the life of the spirit and what that means, that we're all spiritual beings having a human experience. So I'd just love to hear from you. Um, love to hear your thoughts and uh, concerns and, and struggles and um, anything that this might have sparked in you, and especially from the folks that aren't Baha'is, um, let's, let's continue.
Thank you, Rain. Yeah, we definitely uh, uh, really appreciate you coming here this evening. And I know folks are messaging us privately as well as in the public chat, just saying thank you very much and just saying how impactful the quotes that you shared this evening are. Uh, Ray, I believe uh, our first question comes from somebody next to you. Yes, absolutely. I will turn the camera over to Jamie. Hi, Mr. Wilson. This is Jamie Gaston speaking. I'm curious, you know, you, uh, I really appreciated hearing about the journey and kind of how you got to be where you are today. And you mentioned prayer and meditation as being part of, um, you know, your regular routine. And I'm wondering if there are any other, you know, daily practices that help you navigate through, you know, the, the chaos that can be life. This is Jamie and I'm done speaking. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Um, excellent question. Uh, for me, um, prayer and meditation in the morning, and it doesn't have to be long. Um, we, we've talked about that. Uh, Baha'is uh, are asked by Baha'u'llah to undertake some daily practice. And I love this idea of a practice. It's like, um, it's like a, if you're training for a marathon, you know, you, you run a certain number of miles. Um, if you are, you know, a professional painter, you might draw a little bit each day. There's, there's something that you do for your practice. And I love the idea of devotion and de the word devotion coming from being devout and this practice, this devotional practice. And in the Baha'i daily devotional practice, we're asked to read a holy quote. It can be one sentence in the morning and in the evening before we go to bed. And again, I, I don't know why exactly. I mean, there's a lot of writings about that, but I think it leads back to the quote that I um, put, that man is in reality a spiritual being and only when he lives in the spirit is he truly happy. It's to remind us again that we're spiritual beings, to start with a holy quote from in the morning and in the, in the evening. Um, so I do that. And Baha'is also, are tasked with saying a daily prayer and it's really a it's a prayer it's it's a, a daily obligatory prayer um we say it between noon and sunset there's some different versions you can say but there's a very short one that's essentially i don't know how many sentences two or three sentences long it says i bear witness O oh my god that thou hast created me to know thee and to worship thee I testify at this moment to my powerlessness and to thy might, to my poverty and to thy wealth, that there is none other God but thee, the help in peril, the self subsisting. So sometimes I'll do a talk just on that prayer. It's very short, but contained in that prayer is the meaning of life. We've been created to know and worship God. And so again, this is to remind us that we're spiritual beings. Oh, right, I'm a spiritual being. My purpose is to know and worship God. My purpose isn't to answer all the emails in my email inbox and uh, to try and make next month's rent and, um, you know, to, uh, you know, you name it. My that's that's my purpose. So, this this daily spiritual practice, this devotional practice, is to uh, help us on our spiritual journey in our human form. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I appreciate that. Yes, don't call me Mr. Wilson. I'm going to punch you in the nose. Um, <laughs> Thank but you, then, um, uh, you know, there's other ways that people have for spiritual practices. Sometimes people walk in nature. I mean, there's, I mean, I'm sure everyone here has something that they, that they do that can help them uh, balance their lives and shift perspective in their lives. So thanks. Thank you. Perfect. And with that, uh, Ariel Flanick, Plit, if you, you, I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself and uh, you can ask question number two for the evening. Thank you so much. Um, hi, Rain. I'm Ariel. Um, and I would love to hear a little more about your work surrounding climate change, particularly how the Baha'i Faith addresses um, issues like climate change, um, what Baha'u'llah specifically said about the earth. I think you've already sort of covered that when you spoke about the, was it the health of the world? Um, and does the faith help you address 
some of the feelings of hopelessness around the changing earth? And does it also help you relate these kind of existential issues to the children that you work with? I'm a public librarian, so I work with a lot of kids. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that very thoughtful question. Um, so uh, in terms of climate change first, and there's a couple of great questions buried in there. Um, climate change is such a tri tricky topic, uh, as we know. Uh, I It's something that I've been very passionate about and have learned a great deal about. And I've been trying to find different ways to communicate about climate change. So I've, um, I, and I realized that I was just occasionally sending out some angry tweets about climate change and that I needed to actually do more. So I, um, uh, I, I joined a, I'm on the board of a nonprofit um, called uh, Arctic Base Camp that seeks to communicate the science of climate change, especially what's happening in the Arctic uh, to the, uh, you know, the political and business communities. And so we're always looking for new, fun ways, interactive ways to do that. We recently uh, at COP26 shipped a um, an iceberg to this climate conference, and we had a series of ice side chats uh, with people about climate. Um, anyhow, um, I feel like as a comedian. I, my job is to try and make climate change uh, information approachable and interesting, um, and dare I say, fun. Um, I recently produced a video for TED Talks um, with a bunch of comedians about, is there anything funny about climate change? And the answer ultimately was no, sorry, there's not. But climate change is very tricky because I could talk for a long time, but I'm gonna try and keep this very short. It was kind of uncovered recently that uh, a lot of the larger polluters, let's say the petroleum companies and a lot of manufacturing companies and transportation companies were kind of behind this whole movement to like ban straws and recycle plastics and focus on recycling. And there's nothing wrong with recycling and there's nothing wrong with banning straws, but this, the recycling of plastics has, has nothing to do with uh, CO2 and methane being put into the atmosphere. So it's kind of this smoke screen, no pun intended. And um, it's such a tricky thing because we as individuals, we feel, feel so powerless. And in, and in some ways we are, there are things that we can do. We can not eat beef. You know, we can drive electric cars, especially if you live in a place that has um, a lot of good renewable resources and isn't using coal fired uh, electrical plants. There's things that we can do. We can reduce our, our carbon footprint, but really so much of it is in the hands of law. We can divest whatever savings we might have in a mutual fund that, um, you know, invests in uh, petroleum companies or, or petroleum exploration. Um, so there are things that we can do, but we feel so powerless. So that hopelessness that you talked about is again, why I think um, the Baha'i faith is also very relevant because as you start to peel the onion of Baha'u'llah's writings, you realize there is so much uh, profundity there and you start to see the world in a different way. And we realize that humanity is going through um, a, a, a horrific crisis, a crisis of transformation, that there is a great deal of disunity, but there's also a great deal of of unity happening at the same time. And that these forces of um, destruction and forces of integration are happening simultaneously. And that ultimately, take the satellite view, humanity will find peace and heal the world and learn to live together and eliminate racial prejudice and live together in peace and harmony but it's gonna be a lot, a lot of hard times on our way there because these old broken systems that are based on competition and selfishness and putting yourself first and accruing stuff and materialism and you know 
political competition, like all these systems that are based on all these fallacies, they're not going to work. So they're just going to be breaking down more and more. And humanity is going to be going, oh, my God, we need another system. We need a new way of looking at um, how to fix things. And so as a Baha'i, I know that, again, I can use the prayers and the meditations and the Baha'i faith to give myself spiritual solace, but I'm also focused on the long term humanity I'm, I'm i'm focused on i'm focused on humanity i'm working now but i'm focused on humanity two three hundred years from now and i when i think about it that way i do have hope there's going to be a lot of pain along the way it's baha'u'llah describes it as humanity being in its turbulent adolescence so i think that's a helpful perspective Thank you, Rain. Thank you for that answer. And just to draw attention to it, Alex did post um, the TED Talk you referenced in the chat so people can save that link and watch it at a later time. Um, our next question, Rain, comes from uh, Moji Zimmer. So if Moji, if you want to come on and ask Rain your question, you can go to unmute Moji. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep. We got yes. You. yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, hi, Rain. Uh, I'm Moji Zimmer. I'm here with a bunch of uh, friends that are under 62. Um, you, you spoke about uh, the Baha'i faith offering a remedy to the world's ills through the writings of Baha'u'llah. And um, through that, the establishment of unity and peace and, and world peace. I was wondering if you could speak to maybe anything um, specific, maybe some novel ideas within the faith or even maybe not novel ideas um, that would bring about this transformation. You said, you mentioned the, um, the transformation of institutions. Um, so I was hoping you could maybe speak a little to that. That's a big question, I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> Boy, that's a, such a good, that's such a good question. That's such a beautiful question. And I love it because it's really demanding specificity. It's like, okay, we've heard about be loving, lovey-dovey. We've heard that from the hippies for decades. It hasn't really worked. So <laughs> what do you got? What do you got, Wilson? Um, I'd love to hear what Linda Cavill and Popoff has to say about this, but we should get her next time. She's a lot smarter than I am and way more spiritual. Um, I will say that here's one, okay? Consultation. So we all know what consultation is. Consultation is, you know, coming together and talking about a solution. Well, in the Baha'i faith, the act of consolation of consultation is an act of worship. The act of consultation is considered the highest um, form of kind of service as a human being. It's how we are tasked to live our lives in consultation. And by the way, for those Baha'is, consultation doesn't just mean what we do at assembly meetings, consultation in everything in our lives. If you look at the quotes, they're in everything. So this idea of consultation, it might sound like, oh, that sounds nice, right? What's your name again? Is it Moshkan? Um, Moji? Yeah, like, oh, consultation, yeah, that's nice, talking about each other. But, but when you really break it down, when you really say that there is a practice of communing and decision making that includes diversity and honors diversity, it wants diverse opinions in the room. It doesn't want just everyone who thinks in a certain way making the decisions. It wants black people and white people. It wants poor people and rich people. It wants people that are donors and people that are in the trenches coming together and putting ideas onto a table that once the idea is on the table, it's no longer yours, that you detach from the idea. Um, you know, you can have a climate change idea and you say, well, what if we banned speedboats or something? I don't know, that's a dumb idea, but you know what I mean? And then that's no longer my idea. It's like Rain Wilson wants to ban speedboats. It's, a, it's just an idea for us to, to talk about. And this forces us to use our highest human uh, capacities and our highest spiritual capacities to find um, ends. So wherever Baha'is are involved in international relations and Baha'is are involved in climate change and other, you know, peace uh, procedures, you'll always see Baha'is backing this idea of consultation. Let's just bring 
people to the table. And, but it's not about arguing. It's not about like, this is what I believe. It's not about debate. It's about a selfless offering of ideas. And then out of that diversity, uh, arising um, conclusions. So there's a lot more to it than that. And I know I've missed some things about it, but that is a, a it is an extremely powerful practical and spiritual tool that can transform, can utterly transform uh, how things are done. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Rain. And our next question comes from David Curran. So David, let's go ahead and get you unmuted and the floor is yours. I do want to start by saying thank you for pronouncing my last name right, because not a lot of people do the first time. Um, hey, Rain, uh, David, coming from Kentucky, not Maryland. Uh, yeah, Kentucky. <laughs> thank God, a yeah. real state. Good. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I, uh, I'm a huge fan of your podcast. Um, one of my favorite things uh, to hear you ask your guest is what they're listening to or what they're reading currently. Um, my question to you is, what do you consider the book or Baha'i text um, that you would consider having had the most influence on your spiritual journey? And where were you kind of along your path when you read it? Wow, that's you should be you should have your own podcast, dude. Um, <laughs> that was Thank very what, that was very good. Uh, that's very good. Um, well, there's a book that I'm really enjoying right now that I have right in front of me. And I think she might live in Maryland. Does anyone know where Elena Mostakova lives? Someone it's DC. There. DC. She's in the DMV area. Yeah. So. so she wrote this book called Global Unitive Healing. And I just love it. And as a matter of fact, I read the first half. And then I loved it so much, I went back and started it again. Uh, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, I just did her, I just interviewed her on my Baha'i podcast. That'll be coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, oh, someone, look at Alex's. He's so fast. He put the link down there already. He's good. Um, this is a, a terrific book. I, I, like I said, I read the first half. Here's a chapter, What is Mind? Um, she's a psychologist and a therapist and um but a deep spiritual thinker and i just really have enjoyed this book and um it's evoked a lot for me so i highly recommend picking that up um but what baha'i book that's such a great question i wish i had a really scintillating answer um i will say that when i was coming back into the baha'i faith and i was thinking about it i i read the dawn breakers which is a giant 1200 page uh, history of the early Baha'is. And it was very, and it was very, it was an exciting read to me. And it kind of showed me like, oh, this is what it takes. You know, these people sacrificing their lives and giving their lives to, to Baha'u'llah and to this cause, to this new spiritual cause. And it was very uplifting. Um, oh, here, hold on a second. My father passed away about a year and four months ago, God rest his soul. And he, uh, I have his copy of the gleanings from the writings of Baha'u'llah. That was his favorite book. He had read it innumerable times and it's, I'll show you his notations on the back. He has all of these in his handwriting all these pages and quotes and anytime he wanted to have like page 167 um purpose of god uh what is meant by aiding god what is certitude and then he has even he taped in look he taped in another little quotes so he has this uh, dog-eared uh gleanings and that's a really wonderful book uh, as well. It's gleanings is kind of greatest hits of the Baha'i faith. So thanks. Thank you. And for our next uh, questioner, we've got uh, just a few more for this evening. Uh, 
All right, this next one comes from Carson. Uh, so Carson, I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute and ask your questions. Hey there, hi, Rain. Um, so Rain, I wanna first say thank you so much for your performance as Arthur in Six Feet Under, um, loved it. And uh, I also really enjoyed your podcast episode with Lee Hale um, on called Preach. Um, I really loved hearing your story. That was the first time I actually heard about your faith journey. Um, and so I am uh, a progressive and active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And at one point in my life, I was in seminary studying to become an Episcopal priest. And I eventually left seminary with more questions than answers, and I left uh, the Episcopal Church. Uh, and I consider myself a, a seeker. So I'm learning, I, I'm learning more about uh, the Baha'i faith. I have a couple questions. One is, um, is there a doctrine or belief about LGBTQ people in the Baha'i faith? And also, um, there is no perfect organized religion. Um, at least the, that I've studied. Um, what are some of the challenges um, in the Baha'i faith? Um, yeah, two good good questions, hard-hitting questions. I see that you, um, you know what you're talking about. So the question about uh, LGBTQ um, is, a, is a difficult one. And um, on a controversial one, um, you know, we live in a in a world where everything is very black and white. Where it's either like you're you're pro this or you're anti this, and there's kind of not there's no kind of gray area. And in the Baha'i faith, we are taught that everyone has free will to make their choices in their lives, live the life how they want to live. Um, that this is uh, this is a gift from God, is our free will, and that our job is to love everyone and support everyone on their journey. Um, and, you know, Baha'is don't believe in hell. So we don't come at this idea of like anyone who's like any kind of like, quote unquote, in fact, even how Baha'is might look at sin is very different than a lot of Judeo-Christian religions. Um, sin uh, being closer to the original biblical meaning of, uh, it was a archery term to to miss the mark, you know. Um, and so not believing that there's a fiery pit of hell that people are going to, that we're, we're all on a spiritual journey and everyone needs to be embraced. So that being said, there's very little about LGBTQ in the Baha'i writings. Um, what we do know is that uh, Baha'is are asked to uh, in terms of their sexuality, that sexuality is between a married man and a married woman. And that's what we're told in the Baha'i faith. So do with that as you will. Um, I know that there are many gay Baha'is. Um, some of this, some of them obviously struggle with this. Some of them deal with it privately. It's not anyone's uh, job to, to judge anyone or uh, in any way, shape, or form, everyone is welcomed. Everyone is embraced. Um, but that is the that is the the heart of the of that spiritual of that spiritual teaching. Like like all the other major world religions uh, that that kind of teach that that same thing to a, to whatever degree, to a lesser or greater degree. Um, as far as like. Um, imperfections in the Baha'i faith itself and difficulties with that. You know, I feel like, and I think a lot of Baha'is would believe with me that Baha'u'llah has brought down a pretty darn perfect and beautiful system. Um, we're not there yet in enacting it. You know, we talked about consultation earlier, right? So what an incredible, beautiful idea. Well, Baha'is aren't very good at putting it into real practice. You know, we all struggle with it. I struggle with it myself. I want my own way. I have self-will. I, I think I know the best way. And I'm like, duh, we should just do it this way. Um, so I think a lot of the struggles in the Baha'i faith is um, our, you know, our failings to put a lot of these really beautiful ideas uh, into practice. So um, 
there that's just my opinion other buys would say oh maybe this this sucks or that sucks or i struggle with this or i struggle with that but um it's a pretty beautiful system and uh it's certainly the best of any of the other ones that i've seen so thank you so much uh for your question thank you rain that was great um our next question comes from another seeker we have andy gardner so if andy if you want to uh, unmute and come on the floor is yours All right. Thank, thank you very much, Rain. I, um, I, when I saw you were speaking tonight, I, I, I really felt compelled to get on and thank you. Um, not just for your acting career, but, you know, as a seeker, as an act, acting member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, like our last person, they, there was a point at which there were some missionaries going around and you talked to these Mormon missionaries. And the interpretation from these, you know, of these uh, missionaries was, oh, wow, he really likes Mormonism. And the more I learned about Baha'i, and I, you know, when, I, when I first, you know, Rob introduced me to Baha'i, the more I realized your response was actually a really kind of um, respectful and beautiful way of, of appreciating all of the pieces of divinity that we all, that we bring. And I just wanted to thank you as one of those former, you know, missionaries running around for, to being kind, but let you know that your response, you know, while it was nice for them, uh, really shaped my my appreciation of Baha'i, and and I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, I uh, the the question I had for you, I've noticed one thing that's attracted to me with Baha'i and really speaks to me is that suffering and the challenges we have and chaos aren't necessarily these, you know, that comes from the devil or this is the the bad thing. They are. It's the concept of purification and the, the role of, of fire and you know in in cleansing the gold and then conversely the gold and you know in testing the testing the servants and so um what i what i wanted on your side is you've experienced from career ups and downs and mental health ups and downs and um you know your the spectrum of of challenges how has baha'i shaped um shape the way that you you embrace those challenges and the role that you see challenges in your life thank you what's your name andy andy um thank you so much andy yeah i that was very funny because i met these two lovely uh, mormon missionaries at my gate and and i was like oh how's it going tell me about your mormon faith and I took a picture of them and posted it and um, uh, had a nice chat and um, and it was it was nice the the Mormon it was like front page news and like the Desiree Times <laughs> I, I think the Mormons need they need bigger news items frankly um, but truth be told like I love the the Church of, of Jesus Christ of the Latter Day Saints it's such a beautiful faith and. Baha'is have so much to learn from Mormons. I mean, uh, the the lovingness and the primacy of the family unit in Mormonism is just so beautiful. And the devotion to the faith and to Jesus. Um, so many Mormons I know have such a closer, more dynamic, loving relationship to Jesus Christ um, than other you know branches of Christianity. There's so much to learn there. And yeah, I think, you know, Andy, I think you said it really well when you talked about like tests and difficulties. Um, so we talked about this twofold moral purpose that we have. So our purpose is, purpose number one is to grow our spiritual qualities and kind of nurture the garden of our spiritual qualities in our, in our breast. And our moral purpose number two is to try and make the world a better place and use those qualities to help serve others. And um, so uh, this is something that can really help, that has helped me a great deal. First of all, I realized that a lot of the tests and difficulties that I undergo are created by me. Uh, I have been the worst creator of most of my tests. I haven't like, I've been very lucky. It's no, I haven't like had my house destroyed by lightning yet. Um, but uh, 
when, and this is an interesting Baha'i perspective to see, and it's a core to the Baha'i teachings that our tests are there for our purification. Like you talked about purifying the gold, that quote, our tests are there to help us grow qualities that we might be lacking, like patience and kindness and humility and honesty. And so um, tests suck, they're hard, they're difficult, no one wants them. But when you're in the when you're being buffeted by them, uh, including ones involving mental health, we know that this is God sending his love to us in a way for our growth um, and our maturation. So that is one of the kind of key teachings that helps me on this one part of my moral purpose. Um, and uh, I, so I, I, I respond to that as well. So thank you so much, Andy. And then looking at the time here, we've got two more questions for you this evening, Rain. So uh, the first of those questions comes to us from David Gillette. David, I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute. Okay, the question is actually from my good friend, Kindred. So Kindred, you're on. Hi, everybody. Hi, Rain. How are you? Hi, Kindred. Hi. Um, I just, uh, the, there was a quote from Gleanings right at the very beginning of the, um, of, every, of everything. And it was really interesting to me. It really kind of drew, drew me in. I've, I've been in just about every religion you can think of searching for the truth and, um, you know, uh, and I met the Baha'is and I know it's, it's without a shadow of a doubt, this is, this is where it's at. And, but that, um, that quote really touched me because it was talking about how um, it was from Baha'u'llah and it was, he, I think it said something about revealing who he is and um, being put to death or something like that. I didn't get the whole thing, but I basically was just wanting to see um, if you could explain maybe that to me or uh, just let me know uh, where it's at or how I could access it somehow. Both can be done. No, <laughs> you can't have it. <laughs> it's tough. It's a secret Baha'i quote. Um, do we have that, Alex? I'm surprised you haven't linked it already. <laughs> I'm, I'm between two quotes and gleanings with those words, but I don't know which one it is. I'll give you, uh, Corey, could you please, uh, could you unmute, unmute uh, Corey? Because he has a text right in front of him. Corey. We'd love to put it in the, in the chat if possible. Yeah, we'll be it's, done. It's uh, on page 342. All right, I've got it. <clears throat> oh, gleaning. Yes. Cleaning number 154. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. I think you answered this question. Okay. Members, members of the human race, hold you fast by the cord which no man can sever. This will indeed profit you all the days of your life, for its strength is of God, the Lord of all worlds. Cleave ye to justice and fairness, and turn away from the whisperings of the foolish, them that are estranged from God, that have decked their heads with the ornament of the learned, and have contemned, condemned to death him who is the fountain of wisdom. My name hath uplifted them to lofty grades, and yet no sooner did I reveal myself to their eyes than they with manifest injustice pronounced the sentence of my death. Mm. Thus have our pen revealed the truth, and yet the people are sunk in heedlessness. That's good. Was that the quote? Yes, sir. Yeah, all right, yeah. cool. Thank you. What, um, yeah, that's wonderful. So Baha'u'llah lived his whole life under great uh, duress, uh, being tortured, humiliated, his possessions taken, banished from country to country, imprisoned um, in, the, in the worst possible circumstances. And here he is, the, um, 
you know, he, as he calls himself, he is the fountain of wisdom that his mm-hmm. name hath, hath uplifted them. Yeah. Um, his pen hath revealed the truth and the people are sunk, sunk in heedlessness. So, um, it's really, really beautiful, beautiful writings. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Excellent. And our last question comes from Malcolm, and I believe it's Mikhail. Please forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. The floor is yours. Hi, Rain. Mikhail and Malcolm here. My Malcolm, brother- it's so good to see you. Hi, yeah, nice I can see you too. too. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, so my brother and I recently discovered The Office. We have to say great stuff for those who are 62 and older. Just kidding, of course. <laughs> uh, seriously, though, <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you for taking the time to meet with us tonight and for sharing your faith journey. So you talked a bit about all the distractions in the world. Uh, what advice do you have for young people, those of us who are 62 and under, to stay spiritually engaged? Wow, what a what a wonderful question. Um, first of all, and what's your name? You with the glasses? Uh, I'm Malcolm. Malcolm, I think the the best way to stay spiritually engaged is exactly what you did, which is to take a bath mat, cut it with scissors, and turn it into a sweatshirt. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've gotten a lot of comments about it. <laughs> yeah, well done, well done there. Um, uh, um, I, I don't I don't know that I have an answer to that to that question uh guys it's so nice to hear from you and um but I will say that um I think at the end of the day if you kind of boil the Baha'i faith down to kind of one essential thought um well that's that's not that's that's too hard to do that isn't exactly true but one of the key essential principles of the baha'i faith if you could count them on one hand it would be you know uh the thumb is the idea <clears throat> excuse me of service so and you know when i talk to young people i talk about service you don't need to be a baha'i to give service you can be an atheist you could be a buddhist it doesn't really matter but mm-hmm. we live in a very narcissistic, solipsistic society where we're often very distracted and also very self-focused. And social media is, is, is a big part of that. But I, I, I have found and I've seen it um, reflected in the actions of others that in service to others, we find ourselves and find a deep abiding um, satisfaction that can bring a tremendous peace and purpose. And uh, if we think of what we do, everything that we do in terms of service, that that is, that is the spiritual path. And when you look at the great spiritual teachers like Jesus and Muhammad and the Buddha, this is the path that they walked. And, and the other great spiritual teachers like, you know, like, um, you know, Nelson Mandela and uh, Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King, you know, the, the great uh, uh, servant leaders um, of humanity. So uh, I think service is, uh, it's the highest form of worship really in the Baha'i faith is being of service. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'd recommend exploring um, in all of your work. So if you could make those bath mat um, <laughs> sweatshirts for, for the, the chill, the cold children of Norway. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's a great idea. Yeah, we'll get started on that. Okay. Yeah. Well, definitely. Thank you yeah. for the advice. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Alex uh, and Ray, is that the finished question? Yes, that's the last very, question. Very and, good. Uh, yeah, and I very just want to say, Rain, that you know, with all the, th- with all the ways that you're pouring into the world, I think that's a phenomenal way to wrap up the questions. And with all the ways you're pouring into the world to know that you took 90 minutes of your time, because if you're with us, it means you aren't out there. And I just want to thank you on behalf of everyone on this call for uh, you taking that time away from your other projects to pour into us. So thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Nasser. Yeah. So, well, uh, Rain, 
uh, and ladies and gentlemen, really Baha'u'llah in one of his uh, mighty tablets known as a fire tablets, that's a dialogue, symbolic dialogue uh, uh, between divine and manifestations of God, is asking where are the champions? And uh, in my humble opinion, Rain is one of those uh, champions that God was promised us really. Uh, that's really, I can't say anything more and thank you so much. And we will come back to you. <laughs> Keep yourself uh, posted. Uh, okay, Chanel, are you ready for the closing prayer? <clears throat> uh, very good. Okay, very good. Go ahead. It's Chanel. Like <laughs> Go for it, Chanel. Okay, so um, this is a healing prayer. I felt like I chose a healing prayer because I felt like the world really needs healing right now. Um, and after Rain's conversation really about healing, uh, it was definitely necessary. So this prayer is called, Thy Name is My Healing, Oh My God. Thy name is my healing, oh my God. And remembrance of thee is my remedy. Nearness to thee is my hope. And love for thee is my companion. Thy mercy to me is my healing and my succor in both this world and the world to come. Thou verily art the all bountiful, the all knowing, the all wise. Thank you. Thank you, Chanel. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.